Welcome everyone, and I'm so excited today. Uh, this is our first ever podcast, which I've just launched called Paradigm Shifters. And I'm so pleased to introduce my very first guest ever, Evan Greger. He is my friend and colleague. He's a New York City jazz musician, an EFT practitioner, and he has his own YouTube channel called Inner Work with Evan. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Evan. Oh, thank you. And I'm, I'm also your mentee, and I'm happy to be that uh, in <laughs> EFT training. So, Yes, yes, I'm happy too. So, uh, you know, we had such a great conversation last week, and I don't know if everyone who's watching this on my YouTube channel knows that Evan actually interviewed me on his YouTube channel last week, and we had this really great conversation. We talked about narcissistic trauma and um, all kinds of things. And since it was such a great conversation, I actually wanted to invite him today for us to continue this conversation so we could explore a topic that he brought up that I wanted to go into a little deeper. And so what we're going to be talking about today is actually the idea of a narcissistic system. And what in the heck is a narcissistic system? Because I know I tell you all the time, I say, hey, listen, you can have narcissistic trauma, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you have been in a relationship with an individual who's a narcissist. You can actually experience narcissistic trauma from being exposed to a narcissistic system. So why don't we dive into that a little bit more? And Evan, you had mentioned something last week. We'll start with this about how you feel like maybe society or our culture maybe encourages narcissism a little bit. Can you tell me more about that? And it was just an honest insight in the moment based on what you were saying, because obviously that's your expertise is dealing with narcissism, narcissistic trauma. So as you were describing some of the traits and tendencies, I was like, okay, well, I definitely know certain aspects of the music industry where being somewhat unconcerned with what people are thinking, being able to shape shift and just confidently say one thing to one person, another thing to another person, basically lie with a sense of confidence. Um, there are a lot of places where that's going to be rewarded, where that's going to let you navigate the system in a particular way where people would describe you as crushing it. Look at <laughs> look what they're doing, look at all the things they're they're accomplishing, but behind the scenes, it's it can be very driven, it can be very manipulative. And, and I've seen that not only in, in music sometimes, uh, not to say that a lot of the most successful people I've worked with haven't been beautiful people, but I have seen this operate, including in our space, which is supposed to be all about, you know, helping each other and healing traumas and all of this stuff. Some, there's some people that I found like, ooh, behind the scenes, like it's pretty, pretty cutthroat and you don't like when things are not going exactly your way and, um, sort of a seduction of sorts of, you could call it students or followers of, I have the answers, I have the wisdom. And if you're like that, you're going to do better on YouTube often. You're going to do better and therefore have more followers and get more um, potentially clients or people that seeing you as this sort of yeah. spiritual or intellectual or philosophical leader because you can lie with such confidence or you can believe your own nonsense with such confidence that you can sort of speak as the enlightened one or the one who has solved the internet marketing problems and can do it for you too. It's like, as you were describing it, I'm like, I see this everywhere. And it's a lot of the things that get incentivized. Wow. Yeah, totally. Totally. Like when you can see it, um, I think it's so powerful. We can name something. It's like, you can see those behaviors like you just described, but then when you can give it a name, I think it makes it more powerful for, for us to be able to identify it, to say, wait a minute, that's what this is. Because doesn't it feel off? Like, doesn't something in your being kind of feel like, ooh, this feels off, right? This is wrong when you observe it or when it happens to you. It feels off and then there's an extra layer of confusion and frustration because shouldn't the good person win, right? Like why, why is this person who's doing these things that you might be taught as a young child, like don't do that, don't lie, don't cheat. It's like, well, 
here I am seeing this behavior quite blatantly. Like some people, they're not even trying to hide it. And they're winning, quote unquote, winning in a pretty big way. Now, how do I reconcile that? Am I supposed to try to be like that? Um, it's very, it's very confusing in that way. So you see it and you identify it. And also now what do I, what do I do with that? Oh yeah. And you know what that is, is that's just the cognitive dissonance that happens from gaslighting. So that is an actually a form of gaslighting. So when somebody, you know, says one thing, even if it doesn't even have to be directly to you, but let's just say we're talking, let's talk about one of these people who have a YouTube channel or some sort of guru or something in there. They're telling everyone to behave a certain way or be a certain way. And then in the behind the scenes, they're, they're doing something else. And let's just say, you know, you, you, you see this and you see that th these two things are very different and it is very confusing because I think that when we're children, we want to like, if you think about the part of us that's seeing that is the inner child mm -hmm. and we trust this person and we want to believe them and we need them to be right. Because if it's your, if you're a child and your parent, it's your parent, you need them to be right because that's what keeps you safe. So it's a very similar situation. So you're in a situation where there's this person say you trust, and then you see some behavior and it's confusing and your inner child's like, wait a minute. I don't know what to believe. I'm confused. And mm. this confusion creates compliance. It creates mm. situation. It creates, you know, a sense of uh, uncertainty, doubting myself. And so people who've experienced any kind of narcissism when they were a child, definitely they are really set up for these adult uh situations where they can get involved with systems that are like this so cults okay spiritual spiritual organizations that could be considered cultish um toxic workplaces toxic like if you even want to talk about the music industry it's like it's like a it's an industry i'm not saying it's toxic but you could say an industry was toxic so a toxic industry where this kind of dynamic is rewarded and on top of that people who are being harmed by it are not speaking up for themselves because they're confused and they're not sure about whether they're being harmed or not because it's subtle yeah well it's fascinating because the the ones like the cults um those are to me what you might call the super obvious ones but then a lot of the things that you were describing and describing last time is like, oh, but there's this underlying layer of it, even in the culture, that's not as obvious. And the one that jumps out when you're describing the music industry is what I think applies to many, many other industries, if not just being a human, at least in America, <laughs> of I'm not hustling hard enough. I'm not working hard enough. That's why... I'm not ahead. And there's a lot of that in the in the music industry where like, oh, you just need to put out more records or you're not getting enough Spotify plays. It's like, dude, a Spotify play is like 0.01 cent. That is. <laughs> you can you can be literally crushing it on every level mm -hmm. and not make enough to pay for a mediocre New York apartment. And I mean, I I have worked with people that you have heard of and what they might come home with at the end of a tour anymore is it's, it's a joke but yeah. but there's something in the system or the culture that's like well if you had only figured out the instagram or if you figured out the merch or meanwhile the system itself is completely rigged but it's a it's an interesting fine line because you don't want to be a victim and you don't want to feel like well you're complaining or like oh well i you know so you you have to try to reconcile this but when you start pointing out that there there are things in operation there is like what you're describing as possibly a narcissistic uh, system where someone or some organization is perpetuating an idea that's total gaslighting it's like if you were to just work hard you could do 
you could make what the CEO is making, but, but no, it's impossible. You would have to have 400 billion plays of your album to make what they make in a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and when you describe it too, like it's actually what I feel like it is, Greg, uh, Evan, is it's, it's like an entity. I feel like it's not, I, I think we always, I mean, I don't want anyone to think I'm one of these conspiracy theorists because I'm not. And I don't think there's a they out there. I, I don't think there's a they, as in, I think it's, if you look at it spiritually, I think it's an entity and it represents ego. And so I think every single human being, you know, has that within them. So we're all participating in it, whether we realize it or not. It, whether it's on the victim side or or on the you know perpetrator side or whichever side, but the entity exists on this plane, and it's playing out in these systems. So I don't really believe there's just like like a evil genius on the top, like oh, whoa, ha, ha, you know, like <laughs> do it like pulling all the strings. But I think it's it's more complex and it's more um, it's it's more like there's a lack of consciousness. So when there's a lack of consciousness on our part and or a fear of speaking up or trying to to change things or walk away from things that we know can't change, we're perpetuating it more and more. And so I, I'm not sure that it's it's sometimes I think it is conscious. I think there's plenty mm -hmm. of things out there where people are consciously greedy. They're very greedy and they're purposely they're lying and they're manipulating and that's very obvious. Like you said, that's very obvious. But then there's this other layer where it's like people are just kind of going along with things and just not knowing any better. They're just sort of asleep. You know, they just don't know. Or the incentives are so stacked within the system one way versus another that uh, if I'm talking to someone who's like 15 years old and they're like, yeah, I could go this way or I could go this way with my career. And one direction is you can work probably a six hour, eight hour day and get full benefits and health insurance and make uh, great money. And the other way is you're going to maybe be a follow your hobby or interest as a musician, but it's going to go work completely against you in every possible way. Then, of course, it makes more sense to choose the other road. Like, why not be the, the CEO of whatever or be the uh, employee where the incentives just align in a way that makes more sense and so i'm definitely not uh i think it's dangerous to kind of romanticize like we're the artists and we're the good people and then there's the evil corporate people it's like no i mean i wish i was interested in the corporate side and i'd switch in a second mm -hmm. i just didn't choose the fact that what i love to do is play and, and do these other things but within it all of the incentives are aligned um, because the, the head of a record company, their job is to make as much profit. Their job isn't to support the arts. They're not charities. They're not advocacy groups, right? You know, these streaming services, they're businesses. And so if the system itself is designed to say, your job is to make as much money as possible, and there's all these musicians who are willing to play, who are willing to accept this, yeah. and they are because they want to play, it's hard to find a particular fault as much as it's just the system itself is it's inevitable like the water is going to flow in this direction where you are going to have these insane wealth inequalities these insane um social inequalities with this dynamic of if you're not ahead it's because you're just not playing to win and a narcissistic personality from the way you described it is going to be better. Let's, I'm, they're going to be better than I am mm -hmm. at how to play that game for sure. Well, they designed the game and <laughs> they control all the rules and the rules change. So it, yeah, you're set up to lose. That yeah. What you're saying. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's like not even a necessarily a fault thing as much as it is it's just naturally going to end up that way when the system is is a certain um designed a certain way where of course your job is to make as much money as possible therefore you're going to find any way you can cut costs and if there's people willing to to accept it so um the the, the challenging part with within that is 
okay, when are we just complaining? Like, when is this me just complaining? Oh, it's an unfair system. Um, I, I see an unfortunate amount of that with, with some of the people in my world of music or even some of the inner work and emotional healing stuff. Like, oh, the big names get all the, all the play. And it's like, okay, yeah, but us complaining about it is not necessarily accomplishing something. On the other hand, you can't just blame yourself either. So, mm-hmm. so what do you do to empower yourself to kind of navigate that and maybe own those parts of you that, that do need to be a little bit more of a, I don't know, bigger voice or being willing to stand up to things or. Totally. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm always thinking about the inner child. Cause like I think about, yeah. well, the inner child actually needs to be given permission to complain. Right? Mm. That's the part of, that, that part of us needs to be able to express that's not fair. Essentially think about it. Like from a child's point, a child's like, that's not fair. Right. Like that energy of a child and that, and it is true. That child has no power. A child has no power. And so when they feel that, like, it's real, like that's not fair because someone else is controlling their life. And then we grow up and we're adults and same thing is happening. And our inner child feels that deeply even though we do have a choice we always have a choice it may not be the choice we like or want but it's a choice so again the inner child work we have to go to the inner child and we have to to find out what you know what's going on there oh you're right it's not fair you know you're right it's that's okay to feel that way so we have to acknowledge our feelings right basically is what i'm saying and then we have to find out, do I have another choice? Like once the inner child gets validated and that kind of gets resolved, even if it's, you know, some kind of event in the past that it's tied to, then the adult can say, okay, like, let's just use your example of this. This industry is narcissistic and I have a choice. You know, I can, I can do this or that, but like, look at the choices and actually respond to it from the adult's perspective and take your power back. Because it's about, that's what it's about. So if it was in a relationship with a narcissist, you might be like, well, you know, I, maybe I rely on this person for, for financial stability. So I don't have a choice. I can't leave. It's essentially the same thing when you think about it. Interesting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. What you and you do? are. What do you do when you're financially <laughs> a narcissist? Yeah, so it's it's right. It's the acknowledgement of processing through those things emotionally from you know inner child work and different places where those wounds were formed and where you can naturally fall into some of those patterns and some of those uh, relationships or work relationships that are not healthy for you. And then as you're describing working with a child, it's also you want to kind of set the child up for, okay, this is the reality of what you will be confronted with. And so I think we do no favors to kids when we are telling them some version of just be nice, just be good, just be good at your craft, just be, just play your instrument well and be a nice person. And it's all going to work out. It's like, no, 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 that's, that's not true. Mm. and and you're not helping someone because then like you were describing gaslighting you you get in the world you start seeing people who are doing the exact opposite of that doing Mm -hmm. very well and now your whole sort of perspective of the world is turned upside down and you don't you don't know what to do about it and so instead of looking at it as just okay this is purely unfair and i'm there's nothing to do but complain about it's like well no i'm understanding that, that there are these aspects to it and what do I actually want my life to look like? Okay, I want, do I want to be touring and playing music? If so, these are the realities. These are the numbers. And your job becomes, how do I make that math problem work? What other things do I need to do? And then the emotional work gets more interesting. And I know you do that kind of thing with clients where you have to first start with some perspective of what am I actually trying to create or do? And yeah. if I want to be a professional jazz musician, which is what I do, you can't spend your day complaining about how no one listens to jazz anymore. <laughs> and there's a lot of that. 
right? You, you have to say, okay, let me look at it. It's not, it, it's a music that captures a super, super small percentage of the market. Mm -hmm. I still want to do it. I'm going to look at this as objectively as I can and then say, okay, how do I tackle this? What do I actually need to do? What skills do I need to have to be employable? Someone that can show up to a session and sight read something cold, all these different things. And there is a, a useful path forward. But if you understand what you're getting into and you understand that there's the corporate side and the art side, just like, you know, in medicine, there's the corporate side of the medicine industry, which has nothing to do with how many, how many people can I help? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause there's always choices and there's always choices we're not aware of too. Like when I work with clients around something like what you're just describing and let's just say like, well, it's either this or that I could either do this or that. And I like to help people get into a space where you can start to see there's maybe there's choices here. I haven't even thought of. Like maybe there's a path I can't even see right now that's that's completely unknown to me and my mind can't conceive of it. And when you start right. shifting your energy and you do that inner child work and you release trauma and you change your brain and you get into a more coherent brain state, you can start to see other possibilities that you didn't see before. And amazing magical things can happen where you can have everything you want. You can you can have your dream career. And you can have financial success. And it's all about like letting go of those belief systems that some of, you know, and if we're talking about the narcissistic system, the narcissistic systems got it set up to where we're going to lose. And that's the only way it is, right? It's either my way or the highway. Mm. That's, a, that's a very narcissistic thing to say, right? It's my way or the highway. But if we start believing in ourselves, and if you want to be a paradigm, you know, shifter or disruptor, like that's a paradigm, what you're talking about, but mm -hmm. that's just because we believe it. We've been told it and we believe it and we're going along with it. But look at all these people out there that are disrupting other paradigms, you know, like think about mind Valley. Mm -hmm. That's a huge paradigm disruptor around education, like the self education revolution. And think about how so many industries are changing and being disrupted because of people that are doing things we never conceived of before. No. Narcissists don't want you to think creatively. They don't want you to, to have like other sources. So in the narcissistic dynamic, we feel trapped and we feel like we don't have a choice. And we've sort of almost like believing, oh, you're right. It's, you know... <laughs> uh, I, I'm never going to make it this and this and that. But when we shift out of that, we start to see other possibilities and we start living differently. Yeah, that's brilliant. And it's hopeful because that is a very interesting perspective. The, the system itself is designed to make you think there is no other solution. So even when I'm describing something about, you know, the, the stats with streaming services that can come across as you're saying, yeah, so it's all hopeless, right? It's like, no, the, the, the system is designed in a way to say, you should play this game. You need to get, you know, this on social media and you need to do this with your album. But that whole system is designed not to help you. It's designed to help the system. But, yeah. but the kind of work that you do with, you know, EFT and other things to help you literally see it from a different angle. It, yeah. it's, it's like another path. It's just, oh, there's that path, but that path makes no sense. But there's there's infinite possibilities to create another path. And then your mind starts looking for those paths. And I, I feel like that's one of the biggest difference I've noticed is, is someone trying to find a way, if they're using their mental power to try to find a way to win at this rigged game, it becomes futile and frustrating and hopeless. But option B is, okay, how can I work on myself to where I can see out of the hypnosis mm -hmm. and say, oh, but there's actually this backdoor path. There's This path doesn't even exist. It's just a mirage that this is what we're supposed to do, but it's just one person doing it and another person agreeing and another person agreeing. And there is no mathematical reason that makes any sense that I should have been able to um, support myself as a jazz musician these years. You know, I don't come from money. I didn't have another source. And you could look at the numbers. If I was a guidance counselor 
in high school, you'd say, there's just no way. How could you possibly make a living playing jazz? But you, you don't worry about that. You go, let me explore how this can be done. And for some reason, this keeps feeling possible and it keeps feeling right. And so I'm going to go with that. And then I'm going to work on myself for the places where I'm convinced that it's not possible or it's not possible for me. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I love the way you put that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, and I would love, actually, this is a really great kind of segue because I wanted to ask you like personally, what kind of uh, work are you doing with your clients? Can you tell me a little bit about like, what's this inner work with Evan? What's this all about? Yeah, it's it's shifted to a lot more EFT, but it's not the not the only thing that I do. But um, basically, the framework is what I've just looked at as being what any technique I like or has found to be helpful for me and other people over the years. There's certain key elements. So on some level, we're bringing things from the unconscious to conscious, and that can sound super abstract. But the example I always give is just, hey, how's your left shoulder feel right now? suddenly this incredibly mysterious ability just does that i don't know how i do that i just somehow whatever you might call this awareness goes there and my left shoulder has been here this entire conversation but until i put my attention there Mm -hmm. i didn't know the nuances of it and so when you do that in more subtle ways with an emotion so like hey i'm feeling really stuck around how could i possibly be a jazz musician Okay, when, when that thought appears, you know, what are some of the experiences in your body? What are some of the nuances? And that voice that's saying there's just no way to do it, you know, what does that voice remind you of? And it's a real compassionate, actual listening mm-hmm. to that voice. So I consider it from what I call like the repair mindset, which is I have a limiting belief about being a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. So that limiting belief is bad and wrong, and I'm going to use EFT or meditation or imagery to get rid of that negative belief, whereas I look at it more like the voice that's saying I could never be a jazz musician is saying that because it's protecting me and it cares about me and it honestly believes that and it learned that from some type of experience or conditioning Mm -hmm. and it's saying, no, 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 Evan, don't try to do that. That's going to be bad for you. Now, if I listen to it that way, like, hey, why is it important or unsafe for me? Why would it be unsafe for me to be a musician? Now I'm talking to it and I can use something like EFT to facilitate that conversation versus I'm going to tap away your bad belief. That would So anything to facilitate that conversation with those, those parts of you, those feelings, those mm-hmm. emotions, those beliefs. So... EFT would just be one possible tool, but the foundation is that conversation. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, all all this energy work, it all comes, you know, from all these different modalities and they they keep coming together and getting blended. And this person over here creates this modality and this one over here. But I think it all has a lot of commonality, no matter what, you know, within the, the field of like energy medicine and energy psychology and that kind of thing. So, and I also feel like, Honestly, what I found is that most people who, you know, have a problem that needs to be solved, uh, most of the time they don't care what tool you're using. Yeah, totally. As long as you help them, they're just like, how how is this going to help me? You know, but I think we just, we, we use what helped us and and we can Mm -hmm. connect with it. And that's why, I mean, that's why I became an EFT practitioner is because it, it, it helped me rid myself of like a lifelong terrible panic disorder and it was the mm. only thing that helped me and believe me i tried everything so i feel connected to that modality for that reason but everyone has you know a different healing story and they use different modalities so yeah that's awesome that that's how that um came about for you how eft did something so significant oh yeah yeah for sure and it wasn't even something i um was seeking it was one of those things where it it just showed up you know, I, I got an email from Nick Ortner, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the tapping solution. I don't even know how I got on that list. It's seriously, I still try to wrap my brain. How did I get on the list? I didn't need, it wasn't even on my radar. And I just, I opened it one day and I started tapping with him in a video. And I just had this, like, I just started, I burst out into tears. 
Mm. And I was like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> you know, and after that, I was so hooked. I had, you know, I downloaded all the meditations. I was tapping day and night. Um, and then a couple months later, I signed up for a certification program. So I just went all in, you know, after that transformation. So, um, yeah, but back to what we were talking about with your work. Um, if somebody wanted to, to work with you, you know, how would they be able to, to reach out to you and contact you and get a hold of you? The easiest is um, inner work with Evan. So either innerworkwithevan.com will take you to a website or what will come up is my YouTube channel. And okay. then in the description of any video is going to have those links. So Yeah, and I'll put your links down also below in this video description. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So then do you, you're taking private clients and you have a private practice? I do. Yeah. I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. It's probably one of my favorite things to do. And it's, um, yeah, my schedule is somewhat fluid with the jazz musician life. So some weeks I'm more available than others, but it's a, it's just one of those things where there's an online calendar and you, you just yeah, fill cool. in your slot. Okay. So they can just book with you there. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, I really appreciate this conversation. It's been um, really just a pleasure to talk with you and, and just chat about just stuff, you know, it's fun. And um, I really appreciate you being here and sharing, you know, about your little bit personal stuff about your career. And we'll just, we'll probably, I have a feeling we'll keep this conversation going because we could talk a long time about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. But for another, another podcast. How does that sound? Oh yeah. Thanks so much for having me and for all the, all the good work you're doing and the support you're giving me through this process. So. Absolutely. All right then. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you next time. Take care.